Let's go to the back and let's go ahead and get started working Wednesday. I hope you told you our colleagues that uh, we called out people's names. We'll be doing that again today, too. Um, I hope that you had a chance to look at the videos. I know Noam Chomsky is a little bit long. Um, uh, but there's some really, really important snippets today. He's a very important reader of the speaker. And I hope you like Ken Robinson. We'll be seeing snippets of it as well as in today. Um, a couple of things I want to remind you of. We do have a back channel going on. So if you have questions, be in the back of the world is monitoring those. So, so you can log on to that website and you can see a little chat that's going on. I'm sorry that you keep on getting bumped off of the internet, but you know how to do it. You guys are experienced with that, so that's not a big deal. Um, we know there's about a hundred of you who have not signed up for the last course yet. So every seven people, one of them hasn't signed up. So uh, what's up with that? Uh, you need to make sure that you sign up for these. Today we're going to be talking about signing up for some other things. So you want to make sure that you keep pace with uh, the kinds of things that you need to do so that uh, you can successfully complete this course. And I want to remind you that there's no class session on Monday. Yeah. Okay. So, with that name, if you have any questions, I'm more of that. So, that's the description of the things that you need to do on that little book. And as you go through that little book, um, there are some links to websites and stuff that you'll have to do. There's actually a class embedded in there. Uh, today, you're going to hear about the three things that you need to do for, for this section of the course. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about them more in detail after we get through some of the other content. Okay, so the so objectives today. Today we're going to think a little bit more about the purpose of education and changes that, that might happen related back to, you know, the Sumerian Bull, uh, to the uh, Renaissance period, to the colonial period, to the uh, uh, desegregation period of the history of education. We'll be relating purposes to those. Um, we're, gonna, we're going to look for instances and think about instances when uh, education cycles creativity, you know, where this is coming from. And uh, we're going to uh, review design for education, part of a movement of, of stuff uh, that's happening. And today we're going to talk about two of the activities. The third activity is presented to you on Monday. We'll be thinking about two of the activities today. All right. So, we collected a list of ideas from, uh, from you all during class uh, last Monday of uh, all the components of school. And these are the things that we um, pulled, pulled together. I tried to mix, you know, mix them and match them together so they have some sort of sense. And when we talk about school changing, we're kind of talking about these are the kinds of things that might change, uh, that might uh, uh, kind of uh, be different. And I was arguing on Monday that schools have not changed in 4,000 years. But there's been slight little modifications in the kinds of things going on. But for the most part, there's been absolutely no huge significant change. But I think that the time is coming and that will be different. Okay, so you saw the video of Noam Chomsky. Um, he's a professor at MIT, he's a linguist, that's what he's known for the most. So we talked a lot about uh, other kinds of ideas as well. And the piece that I think is the most important piece that he talks about is a piece about the purposes of education. And we're going to watch a small snippet, right? And what I'm going to ask you to do when you're done, when we're done watching the small snippet, is I'm going to ask you to share with somebody sitting next to you what are the two big purposes. How are they just different or how are they the same? And then I'm going to call on a little part. I think I'm okay now. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to use uh, my magic little parts to call on somebody. So make sure that you can articulate to the person sitting next to you what the two purposes of education are. You have a chance to practice. Come on, come on. 
this down a little bit. And I want to please excuse me, my primitive uh, use of uh, the same process. Can you do this? And since it's set, I'm going to the Person sitting up here, talk about the two concepts of education, the two purposes of education. Try to get it in your mind so that you can articulate. Okay? If you need a third person to talk to you about this, that's good. You have three minutes. Thank you. 
context. Okay, Holly Berry. Holly, where are you? Hey, Holly. Can we get Holly a mic? Holly, I'm going to ask you to, to tell us what one of the two ideas are. Okay, one of the two ideas. Learning on your own. Learning on your own. The first idea, right? That idea that came from the Enlightenment. It came from the actual beginning of the Renaissance into the Enlightenment. This idea that you as an individual should achieve learnedness. You should move forward in your learning. You need to be responsible for your learning and you should be creative and, and, and find the maximum potential of your of yourself as you begin to move forward, right? So it's this idea uh, this ideal of, of learning for the learner. So these are kinds of I want to teach you in that sort of way and some of the things that I am doing I believe are in that line. I will give you lots of freedom in, in exploring things that are of interest to you to learn so that you will go in depth and learn in depth. It's a very open idea. The idea that um, we want all people to move forward in their learning and achieve. Okay? That's idea number one, the things we talked about at the beginning of the video. And now let's reach into the volunteer box. Um, so idea number two, practice in your mind, idea number two, let's try. Yes, can you call Cameron again today? Oh, okay, so then, if, if we're not going to call on Cameron, we'll call on Logan Stewart. Logan, where are you? Hey, Logan. Let's put, let's put Logan a mic. Idea number two. That's just Logan. Passing the test. Passing the test. Passing the test. The idea of passing the test. The other words that were brought up during this period was the, what did he talk about as a second component was indoctrination. Indoctrination. The idea that we, as the institutions of school, are somehow supposed to teach you to conform. Too much democracy was another idea he talked about in that in that section. So there's this one idea that the, as a learner you need to achieve, you need to reach your full potential, and that that you have some freedom associated with that with that learning. And then this other idea is that there's this mandate that there's this institution try to mold you into a particular way of being. And that's where we talk about the idea that Logan mentioned, which is 
stuff, right? So, when you have been going to school, you have been focused on passing the, the coffee and the SAT and the CST every year. You have to take those tests, right? So, very much focused on that. You have to meet the ACT requirements with no less than a C and only other courses to be able to go to university. I mean, that's all part of that tradition, right? This molding tradition. And there were people who were planning and thinking after the, after the 1960s were we're thinking we need to find ways to tighten up all of the freedom that people were having. You know what that's going on? That's part of what's happening. But so this is, and we're, what we're beginning to see now, I believe, is that we're beginning to see a pushback away from that. The, the, as, as they say often in a person, this person depends on this, which is swings back and forth, we've moved to lots of control and Hopefully, we're moving away from control. And I'm also going to argue today that there's this component about technology that's going to disrupt all of this. I'm going to show you a miracle today at the end of the day. I'm going to show you a miracle about how technology might change the company. Okay? Two ideas, right? There's, there's the idea that comes from the enlightenment about you, you are the learner. You should have completed that theory because you wanted to, because you wanted to learn about it, right? Not because it's worth any points to you, right? That's the one idea. The other idea is conformity, rigidity, good students' depth, so that they will follow a particular path. That idea is do the survey or I'm going to deduct points to you. Right? Those are the key kind of notions. All right, yesterday, I mean on Monday, we talked about the Sumerian trials, we got to went to school, had his lunch, and he got cleaned a lot. Right? We talked about uh, during the time of the Renaissance, how there was this focus on the humanities and reaching back into the times of the Greeks and, and thinking about uh, uh, you know, developing the mind and the body together. Um, and then we talked about uh, during the desegregation, we talked about how the schools began to change so that there was more integration of, of students within schools. I want you, as a person sitting next to you, to talk about those three things the Sumerian child, the Renaissance period, and desegregation, and try to connect, try to think about which. Which two concepts of Noam Chomsky do those three things go into? Okay? Can you think about that? So, desegregation, which camp does it fall into? Okay, is it the, the linear achieve or is it the indoctrination team? And why are you think that is? Now, go ahead and share with somebody sitting next to you, and I'm going to call on two people from my magic volunteer list. You have three minutes. Okay, let's bring it back together. I'll pick up the post here. Why should we ask Cameron? Okay, we're going to ask Cameron. Cameron, name one of those three changes and identify which camp you think it belongs to. So, it might be Cameron. My favorite student. Sure, okay, so we talked about these three pieces of change, right? The Sumerian time, the, uh, the Renaissance time, and desegregation. And I asked uh, the, the students, the folks, to apply these concepts about Noam Chomsky and see if you can make a connection between these two purposes that, of education that challenge each other and those things. You identify one of them. Um, maybe it's desegregation, the conformity, um, everybody in the school is like doing the same thing. Oh, very nice. I like that idea. Now, originally, Cameron, I thought there might be more of the other camp, right? Uh, but I, I like that idea, too. So my original hypothesis was that, that that notion of the students going into the school, that might, that might tell me the information that all learners, everyone needs to achieve in some way. And the, and the separate but, but equal myth that existed, that, 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 that was a step away from that, so to try to educate everybody, so that might be the other thing. 
However, as Cameron pointed out, if you think about the schools in which the kids were segregated into, maybe that, that increased conformity, that everybody was kind of going through the same sort of pieces, the same sort of stuff. Uh, the Sumerian, I would argue, is the conformity issue. The Renaissance piece, I would hypothesize and argue, is more of the open language piece. All right? So you can, you can think about these purposes of education, how they particularly apply to changes, historical changes in schools. So what we're going to do next is that we're going to um, watch uh, the video about uh, from Ken Robinson again. A couple of things I want to, you to connect with. There's a word you talked about, about called disenthrall. Okay, what does that mean? What happened to the firemen? Is the firemen story embedded in there? And, and, and then I want you to think about this question again, which one of Chomsky's uh, uh, domains is Sir Robinson is that? What is he teaching? Okay? Right, let's watch this and again, sorry for my commitment. But I believe there's a second kind of process, which is as severe, which has the same origin, and that we have to deal with with the same urgency. And I mean by this, I mean, you may say, by the way, that I'm good, you know, <laughs> I have one kind of process, uh, I'll get rid of the second one. Um, but this is a crisis of not natural resources, though I believe that's true, but a crisis of human resources. I believe fundamentally, as many speakers have said during the past few days, that we make very poor use of our talents. Very many people go through their whole lives having no real sense of what their talents may be, or if they have any to speak of. I meet all kinds of people who don't enjoy what they do. They simply go through their lives getting on with it. Uh, they get no great pleasure from what they do. They endure it rather than enjoy it and wait for the weekend. But I also meet people who love what they do and couldn't imagine doing anything else. If you said them don't do this anymore, they'd wonder what you're talking about. Because it isn't what they do, it's who they are. They say, but this is me. You know, it would be foolish for me to abandon this because it speaks to my most authentic self. And it's not true of enough people. In fact, on the contrary, I think it's still true of a minority of people. And I think there are many possible explanations for it. And high among them is education. Because education, in a way, dislocates very many people from their natural connection. And human resources are like natural resources. They're often very deep. You have to go looking for them. They're not just lying around on the surface. You have to create the circumstances where they show themselves. And you might imagine education would be the way that happens, but too often it's not. Every education system in the world is being reformed at the moment. And it's not enough. Reform is no use anymore. Because that's simply improving a broken model. What we need, and the words we use many times during the course of the past few days, is not evolution, but a revolution in education. This has to be transformed into something else. One of the real challenges is to innovate fundamentally in education. Innovation is hard. Because it means doing something that people don't find very easy for the most part. It means challenging what we take for granted. Things that we think are obvious. And the great problem for reform or transformation is the tyranny of common sense. Things that people think, well, they can't be done anyway because that's the way that means that there are ideas that all of us are enthralled to, which we simply take for granted as the natural order of things, the way things are. And many of our ideas have been formed not to meet the circumstance of this century, but to cope with the circumstance of the previous century, but our minds are still hypnotized by them. And we have to disenthrall ourselves of some of them. Now, doing this is easier said than done. It's very hard to know, by the way, what it is you take for granted. And the reason is that you take it for granted. There are things we're enthralled to in education. 
Let me give you a couple of examples. One of them is the idea of linearity. That it starts here and you go through a tank, and if you do everything right, you will end up stuck for the rest of your life. And everybody who's spoken at TED has told it implicitly or sometimes explicitly a different story. But life is not linear, it's organic. We create our lives symbiotically as we explore our talents in relation to circumstances they help to create for us. But you know, we have become obsessed with this linear narrative. And what is the pinnacle of education is getting you to college. I think we are obsessed with getting people to college. Certain sorts of college. I don't mean you shouldn't go to college, but not everybody needs to go, and not everybody needs to go now. Maybe they go later, not right away. I was up in San Francisco a while ago doing a book signing. And there's this guy buying a book. And he's in his 30s. And I said, what do you do? And he said, I'm a fireman. And I said, uh, how long have you been a fireman? He said, always. Oh, I've always been a fireman. And I said, well, when did you decide? He said, it's a kid. He said, actually, it's a problem to me at school because at school, everybody wants to be a fireman. He said, I wanted to be a fireman. You know, and, and he said, when I got to the senior school, uh, my teachers didn't take it seriously. This one teacher didn't take it seriously. He said, I was throwing my life away if that's all I chose to do with it. That I should go to college, I should become a professional person, I have great potential, and I was wasting my time to do that. And he said it was humiliating because he said it was a whole class and I really felt grateful. But it's what I wanted. Now, as soon as I left school, I applied to the fire service and I was expected. And he said, and I was thinking about that guy recently, just a few minutes ago when he was speaking about this teacher. He said, because six months ago, I saved his life. He said he was in a car wreck. And I pulled him out, gave him CPR, and I saved his wife's life as well. He said, I think he thinks better off than now. <laughs> you know, isn't it? Human communities depend upon a diversity of talent, not a singular conception of ability. And at the heart of our challenges, at the heart of the challenge is to reconstitute our sense of ability and of intelligence. This linearity thing is a problem. When I arrived in LA a few years, about nine years ago, I came across a, um, a policy statement, very well intentioned, that said college begins in kindergarten. No, it doesn't. <laughs> If we have time, I could go into it, but we don't. Kindergarten begins in kindergarten. A friend of mine once said, you know, a three-year-old is not half a six-year-old. They're three. But as we just heard in this last session, there's such competition now to get into kindergarten to get to the right kindergarten, that people are being interviewed for it at three. Kids sitting in front of unimpressed panels, you know, with their resumes. <laughs> Looking through, saying, what, this is it? <laughs> You've been around for 36 months and this is it. <laughs> You've achieved nothing, can it? Stop the first six months breastfeeding, but I can say it. <laughs> See, it's outrageous. I can attach them, but it's thanks to the other big issue is conformity. We have built our education systems on the model of fast food. This is something Jamie Oliver talked about the other day. You know, there are two models of quality assurance in catering. One is fast food, where everything is standardized. The other are things like that at initial restaurants where everything is not standardized, they're customized for local circumstances. And we have sold ourselves into a fast food model education. And it's impoverishing our spirit and our energy as much as fast food is depleting our physical bodies. I think we have to recognize several things here. One is that human talent is tremendously diverse. People have very different aptitudes. I worked out recently that I was given a, a guitar as a kid at about the same time that Eric Patton got his best guitar. 
you know, it worked out for Alice, that's all I'm saying. You know, in a way, it did not for me. I could not get the thing to work, you know. No matter how often, how hard I'd lean for it, you know, just, I wouldn't work. <laughs> it's not only about that, it's about passion. Often people are good at things they don't really care for. It's about passion and what excites our spirit and our energy. And if you're doing the thing that you love to do, that you're good at, time takes a different course entirely. Uh, my wife just finished writing a novel, and uh, it's a, I think it's a great book. But she disappears for hours on end. You know this. If you're doing something that you love, an hour feels like five minutes. It's good. Because of the important the, the topic, too. All right. This is the linearity of education. And this is the That's my best guess. But let's turn to that. But we started back. This is the linear nature of education. What is he talking about? Discuss it amongst yourselves. Now I'm going to call on some people. Okay. Let's go uh, let's out here. So somehow we, we, we talk about this uh, linear, this linear, help me John, linearity? Help me just a little. Okay. So linear nature. So maybe I'll call on him, okay? Um, the linear nature of education, all right? And, and he says that we need to become disenthralled with that. What is he talking about? What is he talking about? Let's hear what Austin Kent has to say about that. Austin, where are you, Austin? Oh, right there. Oh, hey, you got to keep on the front. How are you doing? So, um, this is Rob. Um, I just step away from the uh, linear nature of school, I guess. And, and what, what, what is that? Not what would it look like, but what is the linear nature of school? What is that? Uh, going to kindergarten and children's school, and I just talk to the graduate high school and go to college. Mm-hmm. Right, so there's this, we have this, thank you, that's right. Um, we have this, we have this notion that, kinder, you know, college starts in kindergarten, right? I, I go visit schools as part of my work in preparing teachers for uh, the cinema county area. And I'll go into kindergarten and you'll see the strength of attendance in the kindergarten class, right? The students are, are, are very, from very early on, are, are told that their goal is for them to get into college. And the father lost step. You got to make sure that you do this in seventh grade, so that in eighth grade you can take this class, so that in ninth grade you can take this class, so that you can move forward onto, you know, uh, uh, college as your choice. Right? So that's so that's that, that linear nature. He says we need to disconnect from that. We need to we may need to challenge that idea. How does a fireman example play into that? How does a fireman example? I know the fireman is a senior, he's a person, oh, you could be so much more. How does that play into that? If a person sitting next to you, expect that from him. Okay. Well, I think you have to be very why, He's not here today? Okay. Well, let's find somebody else. Francis Lynch. Now here as well. Okay. How about, uh, uh, Joseph, uh, Ramester? All right, Joseph. Give him a mic. Why, why did you, why do you think Robinson tell that story? And how does it relate to the reality of education? Because okay. oh, um, well his teachers kind of uh, had to go the linear route of going straight to college and doing what everybody's supposed to do and his personal talent led him to be a fireman, which is what he was supposed to do. Great, but that's the actually a challenge of this linear nature of education, right? This teacher's excellent response. Um, the teachers were telling him, no, you've got to go to college. You know, firemen is underneath you. You know, it's not something that, that, that you should pursue. And, and actually, it's an example of this kind of passion thing that he's talking about. 
um, that, that we need to potentially develop, right? And, and I would argue, if you relate this back to Ben Tomsky's ideas, that we're talking about the first idea, right? The idea, the more open idea, the less the idea, not about indoctrination, but uh, the idea about having the learner achieve and move forward. That's the idea that the fireman was following. That's the idea that Ken Robinson is proposing. And he has some interesting ideas in here. You know, I, I look at that and I go, okay, well, show me some facts. Show me some actual actions. Show me some things where there's some things substantive that's changing in schools that may, that may be useful on, in the way it's this. And there are these things going on. There are very exciting, very powerful things. In fact, I found something that I'm going to show you in a moment of a young person. Probably my guess is that she's seven or five to seven years older than the average age in here. All right? She, she's a, a person from San Francisco doing this job. Let's listen to what she was able to do to create change in schools. And then we're going to talk about it. Yes, we do. This is a story of a place that I now call home. It's a story of public education and of rural communities and of what design might do to improve both. This is Bertie County, North Carolina, USA. To give you an idea of the where, so here's North Carolina, and if we zoom in, Berkeley County is in the eastern part of the state. It's about two hours east driving time from Raleigh, and it's very flat, very swampy. Stop. There's no internet cafe, there's no movie theater, there's no bookstore, there isn't even a Walmart. Racially, uh, the county is about 60% African American, but what happens in the public schools is most of the privileged white kids go to the private Lawrence Academy. So the public schools, students are about 86% African American, and this is a spread from the local newspaper of the recent graduating class, and you can see the difference is pretty stark. So to say that the public education system in Berkeley County is struggling would be a huge understatement. In fact, two years ago, only 27% of all the third through eighth graders were passing the state standard in both English and math. So it sounds like I'm painting a really bleak picture of this place, but I promise there is good news. Uh, the biggest asset, in my opinion, one of the biggest assets in Berkeley County right now is this man. This is Dr. Chip Dollinger, fondly known as Dr. Z. He was brought in in October 2007 as the new superintendent to basically fix this broken school system. And he previously was a superintendent in Charleston, South Carolina, and then in Denver, Colorado. Um, he started some of the country's first charter schools in the late 80s in the U.S. And he is an absolute renegade and a visionary, and he is the reason that I now live and work there. So in February 2009, Dr. Gollander invited us, Project H Designs, the nonprofit design firm that I founded, uh, to come to Berkey and to partner with him on the repair of the school district and to bring a design perspective to the repair of the school district. And he invited us in particular because we have a very specific type of design process, um, one that results in appropriate design solutions in places that don't usually have access to design services or creative capital. Um, specifically, we use these six design directives, probably the most important being number two, we design with, not for, in that when we're doing humanitarian-focused design, it's not about designing for clients anymore, it's about designing with people and letting appropriate solutions emerge from within. So at the time of being invited down there, we were based in San Francisco, and so we were going back and forth for basically the, the rest of 2009, um, spending about half our time in Berkeley County. And when I say we, I mean Project H, but more specifically, I mean myself and my partner, Matthew Miller, who's an architect and a sort of MacGyver-type builder. Um, so fast forward to today, and we now live there. I have strategically cut Matt's head out of this photo to he'd kill me if he knew I was using it because of the sweatsuit. But um, this is our front porch. We live there. We now call this place home. Over the course of this year that we spent flying back and forth, we realized we had fallen in love with the place. We had fallen in love with the place and the people and the work that we're able to do in a rural place like Berkeley County that, as designers and builders, you can't do everywhere. Um, there's space to experiment and to weld and to test things. Uh, we have an amazing advocate in Dr. Zollinger. There's a nobility of real hands-on, dirt-under-your-fingernails work. 
Uh, but beyond a uh, personal reason for wanting to be there, there's a huge need. There is a total vacuum of creative capital in Berkeley County, and there isn't a single licensed architect in the whole county. And so we, we saw an opportunity to bring design as this um, untouched tool, something that Berkeley County didn't otherwise have, um, and to be sort of the, the to usher that in as a new type of tool in, in their toolkit. The initial goal became using design within the public education system in partnership with Dr. Zollinger. That was why we were there. But beyond that, we recognized that Berkeley County as a community was in dire need of a fresh perspective of pride and connectedness um, and of the creative capital that they were so much lacking. So the goal became, yes, to apply design in education, but then to figure out how to make education a great vehicle for community development. So in order to do this, we've taken three different approaches to the intersection of design and education. And I should say that these are three things that we've done in Berkeley County, but I feel pretty confident that they could work in a lot of other uh, rural communities around the U.S. and maybe even beyond. So the first of the three is designed for education. Uh, this is the most kind of direct, obvious intersection of the two things. It's the physical construction of improved spaces and materials and experiences for teachers and students. This is in response to the, the awful you know, mobile trailers and the outdated textbooks and the terrible materials that we're building schools out of these days. And so this played out for us in a couple different ways. The first was a series of renovations of computer labs. So traditionally, the computer labs, particularly in an underperforming school like Berkeley County where they have to benchmark test every other week, the computer lab is a, is a kill and drill testing facility. You come in, you face the wall, you take your test and you leave. So we wanted to change the way that students approach technology to create a more sort of convivial and social space that was more engaging, more accessible. And also to increase the ability for teachers to use these spaces for technology-based instruction. Uh, so this is a lab at the high school, and the principal there is like, in love with this room. Every time he has visitors, it's the first place that he takes them. And this also meant the co-creation with some teachers of this educational playground system called the Learning Landscape. It allows elementary level students to learn core subjects through gameplay and activity and running around and screaming and being a kid. So this game that the kids are playing here, in this case they were learning basic multiplication through a game called Match Me. And in Match Me, we take the class, divide it into two teams, one team on each side of the playground, and the teacher will take a piece of chalk and just write a number on each of the tires. And then she'll call out a math problem, so let's say four times four. And then one student from each team has to compete to figure out the four times four is 16 and find the tire with the 16 on it and sit on it. So the goal is to have all of your teammates sitting on the tires and then your team wins. And the impact of the learning landscape has been pretty surprising and amazing. Some of the classes and teachers have reported higher test scores, a greater comfort level with the material, especially with the boys, that in going outside and playing, um, they aren't afraid to take on you know, a, a double-digit multiplication problem. Uh, and also that the teachers are able to use these as assessment tools to better gauge how their students are understanding the material. So with design for education, I think the most important thing is to have a shared ownership of the solutions with the teachers so that they have the incentive and the desire to use them. So this is Mr. Perry, who's the assistant superintendent. He came out for one of our teacher training days and won like five rounds of matching in a row and was very proud of himself. So the second approach is redesigning education itself. This is the most complex. It's a systems-level look at how education is administered and what is being offered and to whom. So in many cases, this is not so much about making change as it is creating the conditions under which change is possible and the incentive to want to make change, which is easier said than done in rural communities and in inside-the-box uh, education systems in rural communities. So for us, this was a graphic public campaign called Connect for T. There are thousands of these blue dots all over the county. And this was for a fund that the school district had to put a desktop computer and a broadband internet connection in every home with a child in the public school system. Right now, I should say, there are only 10% of, of the houses that actually have an in-home internet connection. And the only places you get Wi-Fi are in the school buildings or at the Bojangles fried chicken joint, which I find myself squatting outside of a lot. Aside from you know, getting people excited and wondering what the heck these blue dots were all over the place, it asked the school system to envision how it might become a catalyst for a more connected community. It asked them to reach outside of the school walls and to think about how they could play a role in the community's development. 
So the first batch of computers are being installed later this summer, and we're helping Dr. Zollinger develop um, some strategies around how we might connect the classroom and the home uh, to extend learning beyond the school day. And then the third approach, which is what I'm most excited about, which is where we are now, is design as education. So design as education means that we could actually teach design within public schools and not design-based learning, not like let's learn physics by building a rocket, but actually learning design thinking coupled with real construction and fabrication skills put towards a local community purpose. It also means that designers are no longer consultants, but we're teachers. And we are charged with growing creative capital within the next generation. What design offers as an educational framework is an antidote to all of the boring, rigid, verbal instruction that so many of these school districts are plagued by. It's hands-on, it's in your face, it requires an active engagement, and it allows kids to apply all the core subject learning in real ways. So we started thinking about you know, the, the legacy of shop class and how shop class, wood and metal shop class in particular, historically has been something intended for kids who aren't going to go to college. It's a vocational training class. It's working class. It's blue collar. Uh, the projects are things like, let's make a birdhouse for your mom for Christmas. And, and in recent decades, a lot of the funding for shop class has gone away entirely. So we thought, you know, what if we could bring back shop class, but this time orient the projects around things that the community needed and to infuse shop class with a more critical and creative design thinking studio process. We took this kind of nebulous idea and have worked really closely with Dr. Zollinger for the past year on writing this as a one-year curriculum offered at the high school level to the junior class. And so this starts in four weeks and at the end of the summer. And my partner and I, Matthew, and I um, just went through the arduous and totally convoluted process of getting certified as high school teachers to actually run it. And this is what it looks like. So over the course of two semesters, the fall and the spring, the students spend three hours a day, every single day, in our 4,500 square foot studio slash shop space. And during that time, they're doing everything from going out and doing ethnographic research and doing the need finding, coming back into the studio, doing the brainstorming and design visualization to come up with concepts that might work, and then moving into the shop and actually testing them, building them, prototyping them, figuring out if they are going to work and refining them. And then over the summer, they're offered a summer job. They're paid as employees of Project H to be the construction crew with us to build these projects in the community. So the first project, uh, which will be built next summer, is a, uh, an open-air farmer's market downtown, followed by uh, bus shelters for the school bus system in the second year and home improvements for the elderly in the third year. So these are real visible projects that hopefully the students can point to and say, I built that and I'm proud of it. So I want you to meet three of our students. Uh, this is Ryan. She is 15 years old. She loves agriculture and wants to be a high school teacher. She wants to go to college, but she wants to come back to Berkeley County because that's where her family is from, where she calls home, and she feels very strongly about giving back to this place that she's been fairly fortunate in. So what Studio H might offer her is a way to develop skills so that she might give back in the most meaningful way. This is Eric. He plays for the football team. He is really the dirt bike racing, and he wants to be an architect. So for him, Studio H offers him a way to develop the skills that he will need as an architect, everything from drafting to wood and metal construction to how to do research for a client. And then this is Anthony. He is 16 years old, loves hunting and fishing and being outside and doing anything with his hands. And so for him, Studio H means that he can stay interested in his education through that hands-on engagement. He's interested in forestry, but he isn't sure. So if he ends up not going to college, he will have developed some industry-relevant skills. What design and building really offers to public education is a different kind of classroom. This building downtown, which may very well become the site of our future farmer's market, is now the classroom. And going out into the community and interviewing your neighbors about what kind of food they buy and, and from where and why, uh, that's a homework assignment. And the ribbon cutting ceremony at the end of the summer when they have built the farmer's market and it's open to the public, that's the final exam. And to the community, what design and building offers is real, visible, built progress. It's one project per year. And it makes the youth the biggest asset and the biggest untapped resource in imagining a new future. So we recognize that Studio H, especially in its first year, is a small... I'm going to post that so you can, uh, you can look at the whole thing. I took just segments out of it. Um, what do you think? What kind of ideas is she talking about? Is this a fundamental change of education? 
What do you think? What were some of the important pieces that you got out of that? Share with uh, somebody sitting next to you. What were the important pieces that you got out and you were just a change? So I looked, I looked at this, I looked at this, and I identified something that I thought was really different. Okay? I mean, you know, there's, 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 there's tires out there, and the kids, you know, learning multiplication tables on their tires, the tires, you can imagine, all that can be very, 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 but what was very challenging and interesting here, in my opinion, was the purpose of education. A reconnection back to the community. Imagine what that would look like back at your home, back at your high school. And it's really different. You're, you had your high school, you know, and homecoming and all that stuff. But if you have these huge projects for you to go out into the community, identify a need in the community, and work with your peers, other students in, in the school, to solve that problem? No. I, 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 I've seen very, very few of those things. Uh, there was a project going on in the elementary school here where they some students set up a little store. Uh, you may have experienced that in your, in your school. Um, I know of, of, of another uh, middle school where the teachers and the group of students would sell burritos to kids at lunch to make money. Uh, so it was just me that they needed to find. But this idea of connecting the, 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 the role of school with the community focused on the need, that's a fundamentally different way of thinking about school. Right, it's the same place. If you know, if they still had the, the tests that they had to do, they still had computers, but they really designed the whole purpose of the educational experience towards something else. That was fundamentally different. And you know, everything I thought when I saw this, I thought of all of you. I thought of you and I said, wow, three or four years from now, you're finished here. You could go out and start projects like this. You could go out and create these, these projects, these ideas. I saw you in that video. And I was very impressed by that. And I said, wow, this generation is going to have a lot to offer to education. Last comment on this, which one of Noam Chomsky's ideas is this? Number one, the open idea or the indoctrination idea? Ah, uh, the open one, right? Probably the open one. Wait, we have a five minute break. I'll call you back. So, one time, this book just killed by Patty Smith at all. First hundred pages read because my colleague, Dean Fane Stern, is going to be leading the conversation on Wednesday. So, the first hundred pages. How many pages? The first hundred, right there. Great, first hundred pages. So one thing. Now, three assignments. Three assignments. Assignment number three, you're going to get that on Monday. Assignment number one is called a capsule timeline education timeline posting. All right? What we've been learning about for the last few days is that we've been learning about the idea that, you know, there have been, there have been these modifications or slight changes to education and that they, they may reflect different kinds of purposes. So I'm going to ask you to do in this uh, idea and this activity is I want you to show us what you know about it. So you're going to find some sort of something, some change in education. You're going to answer a couple of questions about it. You're going to find some primary source documents that represent that thing. And you're going to link it back to the first lesson that you have with Dr. Reader, where she talked about kind and unkind activities and different kinds of social change. And you're going to talk about which kind of social change that is. And then you're going to link it back to Dean Silver, where he talked about 
the, uh, the, the exemplary leadership skills, right? Encouraging the heart, inspiring the vision, motivating others. You know, this is five things. So all my PowerPoints, you can go right into their PowerPoints and get that information, okay? You're going to first think of something, then you're going to answer some questions, find some primary source documents, and then you're going to answer a couple questions about leadership and about change. You're going to make a, a, a TPT, then you're going to PDF that TPT, and then you're going to post it. You're going to use a PowerPoint presentation, make a PowerPoint presentation, you're going to print it in PDF for them, and then you're going to post it to text. Okay? So if you don't know how to do that, this is a good chance for you to learn how to do it. So let me show you around the place, okay? I'm going to give you a lot of stuff that was the first one to know. So here we are in my magic model. So here's the education timeline posting due date. Monday. Question. Do you know what this is? Well, you know what this is. They call me the chipmunk because of my picture. How is it going? Okay, so you click on there. Okay, here is all the explanation of, of this. Right? It talks about what this thing is, there's links in here, blah, blah, blah. First step, first step, right? You choose a topic. Right? And all of this is available there on Moodle, so you can read it. Okay? And your peers are learning how to do this too. They can help you. Right? So you're going to create a PowerPoint slide. Three slides only. Right? Those are the questions that you need to answer. Okay. Slide number one. Right. You make a, a portable document uh, using the portable document format. Um, it's actually uploading, and then you're going to post it on Capsules. And I'll take you through there. Then there are several steps about posting to Capsules you need to follow, um, and then you need to capture the link. Okay? And so the first to Capsules is Capsules. All right, so let's look first an example of what the project might look like. Okay? And I have one here. Where is it? Oh, here it is. Okay, so, all right, here is an example of one already made into a PDF, um, and so here are, the, here are the questions answered, and how many slides are there in this PowerPoint? Three, okay, the first one is answering the questions, right? Oh, I even put the title at the top. I, I innovate it. Number two, slide number two is a primary source document. Something that represents the time period, something that represents the, the, the actual uh, change. So it could be a newspaper clipping, it could be a snippet of a TV ad, there's a lot of stuff on YouTube you might be able to use. Um, it may be a, a, a story um, written in a book. It could, be a whole bu- it could be a whole bunch of different things. So think about something that may have changed in education and then identify uh, uh, that change and then kind of find something that represents that change. All right? Um, if you were to look at the notes of this, I have all this reference. So, very important to talk about reference. And then the final slide, there are three slides here. Uh, the final slide um, is uh, the uh, answering the other set of questions. Okay? So, you choose something, you close this PDF. Now, when you do this, I hope that you don't do this alone. I would like you to work with somebody else on this project. Tours are preferred. So I would like you to make sure that, you know, if you work with somebody else, it will make the, the job much more exciting, I think. And uh, it will also give you an opportunity to uh, collaborate. So let's go to Capsules. This is what we're going to post. And if I could figure this out, you can figure this out. All right, so you got to set up, make an account. So I made up an account for myself. You're not going to use my account, you use your own account. Yeah, right, of course. 
the floor. So here, now I'm in my attack. I knew that. So now, here I go to either my stuff at the floor of the room. I'm going to make a new capsule, or I can look at capsules I already created. Okay? Let's make a new one, because that's what the, uh, the, the thing that we're going to have to do. Here is the page that shows you how to create them. All right? So here, you add the title of your capsule, right? Uh, humanistic tradition, because that's in my title. All right? That would be one piece. This is really important. You have to plan your thing. Make this work properly. And it's embedded in the instruction. Right? You want to call this UMV 222. And it, it, these are in the instruction. SSU. Right? What this is going to do is it will be able, we'll be able to search all 750 of yours and put them all together into one timeline. And it'll be very exciting. To see that. It's time for us. And we want to make sure. Maybe it's a little bit. All right, and then all you're going to do now is upload the, that, that PowerPoint uh, PDF file that you have. And you have three choices of how to upload here, here, or here. You want to use the stock one. You want to use the stock one. This is probably going to be the toughest thing that you're going to have to do. Okay? If I use this one, Look at that format there. Okay? If I use the stop one, I get to change the date. And we're trying to make a timeline. So if you're doing desegregation, you're going to have to pick sometime 1954, right? About time period. So here, you click on the calendar, and let's say I want to put my, my, my thing that I did is, you know, 1400, the humanistic tradition. So I can go back that far. So I'm going to go back as far as I can, which is really, really, really fast. 1753, yeah? and anything before 1753, we're just going to put that there. There are some instructions that we're going to do. Just put that there. Put the there. And you notice that this changes. So I'm going to find it through the next exhibition. And files. And then I have a file which I want to save some other stuff. Okay, I have a file and I, and I click start upload and it loads. Alright, and then it's there. You can then go and once you've completed that, let's probably use this. Okay. 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 Six of these things posted on there. What I would like you to do um, is to go on there and look at the examples I posted. I posted several examples on there. And the way that you can find them is by searching for that tag. What's that tag? Uni, Uni V222 FSV. You type that in the search space of, 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 uh, of the chapters, and then that will get you in there. And then you get to actually see some of the things that I posted. All the instructions are there, and I know it's going to take us some time to figure this all out, but it's actually a pretty interesting thing. And then when we come back in April, we'll take some time to talk about these sort of things. Okay, that's number one. That's the first assignment. It's due on Monday in the afternoon. Okay? And if people are having problems with the loading of the capsules, I can easily extend that time. The hardest thing I think is choosing the partner and choosing the content that you want to upload. Okay? Any questions? Yes. Yeah. Now. Now, yeah, so how do you turn in the PowerPoint? So what's going to happen is that you, you close the PowerPoint, 
Um, what you're actually doing when you create your PowerPoint and upload it, you're creating a web page. And you can capture that link. Let me tell you how to do it. That's what you said, okay? You capture that link. And both of you, or three of you, can then take that same link and post it in Moodle to complete the assignment. Okay? So what you're doing is you're going to post the link that you create from Capture and put it into Moodle. You're both going to put the same link in. Okay? Do you have another question? Yes. You will post together, you post one thing. Okay? But you post one thing to Capture. In Moodle, how many things are you going to post? Two, one for each of you. Okay? Other questions? No. No. So you might have to have a partner. If you're in a web page, you're going to take this PDF and you're going to post it down. If you want to post a blog post, you can post media, you can post video. If you explore capture, to take, to see all kinds of stuff with that. And you can do all those kinds of things too. You can create all different kinds of things to do. The minimum requirement is where I fit it. Okay? All right. Now let's talk about assignment number two. I would like to invite up to uh, the podium here, uh, Eric Weissman and Genevieve Sullivan, who are going to help us. I'm going to disconnect this. Merrick and I are here today to talk about a community service component um, that you have with this university student speech class. And while she's setting up one of the things that you'll be shown, all of this is on also on Moodle. So um, you can click actually right below that other assignment and get all of your instructions. Um, but the community service component is being brought together by three different aspects. One, uh, Maris is going to talk to you about Discovery Day and Shadow Day, which are brought um, to us by the, the Center for Community Engagement here on campus. And we'll talk to you about how to sign up for that. Those are both on campus, and so go through those dates. Uh, the Volunteer Center of Sonoma County is going to be helping us out with some projects that are going to be posted on ComEx, which is also what Maris is setting up to show us. And third is um, we will be considering any community service that you have already done this semester or will be doing this semester with other organizations and groups. So groups like your consider organizations, um, if you do service with your religious organizations at home, uh, JUMP, which I'm very familiar with, uh, will all be counted towards this requirement. If you already have service that you have done or will be doing this semester with any other class or organization, there is a link to an org sync form that you will have to fill out in order for that to be counted. That form will ask for your name, your student ID, your email. Um, it asks for the name of the organization. If it's a class, you would just put the, the class name on there and then also the contact to confirm those hours. So if you've already done, like I said, if you've already done service or are already going to be doing service with another organization on campus, that counts for this requirement. And you just need to fill out that org sync form on Moodle. Hi, I'm Mary. Has anybody ever done Discovery Day or Saturday before? If there has to be some people, there has to be some. Okay, so you guys know it's fun, right? Pretty fun. So here's how they work. So this is for you if you are not already doing service. If you are already doing service, you're going to fill out the work thing for If you're not already doing service, these are some possibilities for you. They're very easy and they're lots of fun. Discovery Day and Saturday. These uh, projects are with, they're with children to help them come to college. That's what we hope they will do as a result of this. We're going to be working with high school students, and you're going to be serving as role models and mentors for them. We're working with high school students from Rosen University Prep, which is a uh, kind of like a charter school, but not really a charter school. It's in Roseland, which is on the outskirts of Santa Rosa. It's mostly a low-income, mostly entirely Latino community. And but these, these kids are on a college path because it is a university prep school. You're going to be learning about the kids' school and the neighborhood and some of their uh, resources that they bring and some of the challenges that they face. And you're going to get to know a few kids, whether you do Saturday or the Saturday. Both of these have a one-day commitment plus a one-hour orientation commitment. 
and both of these projects are on campus. You do not need to go anywhere. Both the orientation and the day are on campus. So, do you have no classes on Fridays before 3? If so, Discovery Day might be for you. If you do have classes on Friday before 3, Discovery Day is not for you. The purpose of Discovery Day is to provide these RUP freshmen with a fun exposure to higher ed. It is meant to be fun. It is not meant to be particularly realistic. It's meant to get them really excited. You and another University 222 student will be matched with three to four RUP students. You're going to go on a scavenger hunt. You're going to go to a softball game if the weather's good. And get this, we're actually going to give you that. The orientation is on Friday, February 15th, 8.30 to 9.30 in the NPR. The day is on Friday, March 1st, 8.30 to 3 in the Cooper. We run. Okay. So Discovery Day doesn't work for you. Let's talk a little bit about Saturday. On Mondays, do you have class between 9.20 and 2.40? And... This class, yeah, this class, this class, but besides this class, and no classes between 2.30 and 3. Then Saturday might be for you. Other classes besides this class on Monday. The purpose of Saturday is to provide the RUP juniors with more of a realistic sense of the higher ed experience. You'll be matched up one-on-one -on -one with an RUP student. They're going to go to class with you. They're going to go to your on-campus job with you. If you have student club meetings, you go, you're going to go to lunch in the dining hall with them. All your normal stuff. We're going to provide your RUP student with a lunch card that you're going to need to use your own for this one. And the orientation is Monday, February 18th, 8.30 to 9.30 in the NPR. You're going to be excused from this class to go to that. And the actual shadow day is Monday, March 1st, 8.30 to 3. You will be excused from this class for that, too. Those are Discovery Day and Shadow Day. This Prezi is embedded in Moodle. So it will be. So you'll be able to go back and look at the details if you want. But the details are also all listed in Comesh, and we're going to run through that now. So we you get set up for this, for, for this. Let's, uh, let me field a couple questions, but let me kind of rearrange you here, okay? First of all, we expect you to do some sort of community service. If you are doing community service already, that counts, then we'll show you the way to make, make sure that you get, you get, kind of get the credit for it, okay? If you can't do either of these two Saturday or Discovery Day, there are going to be other options we're going to hear about uh, more in detail uh, about in a moment. Um, and everything that you do about community service is going to be done through Coma. Do you have a question? No? Does anybody have a question? No. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Got a mic? That's, that's the target for Chief Remember, I'm, I, I am Norm Tomsky's first idea, not the second idea. Shooting for six. You want to do more? Great. Okay. Discovery and Saturday are here on campus. Okay. Uh, let me talk about the Okay, we have another question. Let me talk about the other option, then we'll go here. Okay. Question in the back. Just hold on a second, let's get a mic to you. There's four quarters here, you service count for the same thing. You think so? What do you think? talk about it. 
Okay, the first one is the next variable. Okay, next variable, right? Should call order community service parents. Raise your hand if it's no. Raise your hand if it's no. Okay, you got it. Okay. Okay. All right. Last opportunity. There are some of you out there. So, let me finish this piece and then we'll answer your question, okay? So, there are some of you out there who may already have a project in your mind. You may have some idea, some, some project you want to carry out with a group of people. If that is true, if that is true, then there's a way for you to actually submit. I'll, I'll get louder when you fly it down. Okay? So, if you already have some idea or some project in mind that you want to carry out, then you can also email me directly. Um, if you look at the, if you look at the assignment on later, it tells you how to do this. You can propose something to me. Let's say, for example, you already know that, that you know, if, you know Let's say Monta Vista Elementary School, they have a need for some sort of thing going on. And somehow you know that. You know that there's this community need out there. And you want to propose a project where you take a small group of your friends, you, you're the leader, and you go out there and you do this project. If you do that, then there will be opportunities for you to, to use that time as well. But they require pre-approval by me. And if you do propose these kind of ideas, and then say I have five or six groups for students to do this, then I'm going to teach you how you might be able to ask for money to do your community service project. But you have to have a reasonable proposal. So that can be for a very limited number of you, and in middle way describes what you need to do to get permission for that. So there's, there's two kinds of permission. Commission number one, if you are doing community service. Commission number two, if you want to do your own special proposal. And then I'm going to be working with you individually to help you implement that and see if we can get some money to help you carry out that proposal for these independent projects. All right, you do all the kind of things on now. All this is in real time to explain. And of course, we're going to learn how to do this for 750 students if you can want. You have a question. Where is the room that we have to meet at for the orientation? The orientation at the NPR, in the NPR, which is in the student union. The multi purpose room in the student union is on the first floor of the student union. The one with the in the corner. And you'll get, if you sign up for either Discovery Day or Saturday, all the information about it and all where everything is is in Comash, which I'm going to run through in a second. And in addition, you'll get emails from me reminding you of where to be when. Are you ready? So, like most things in this class, home, you're a guinea pig again. So, Comesh is in beta. We are still testing it. And so, thank you for helping us test it. I'm asking for your help. When you discover things that aren't right and don't work right, please let me know. You can do that right from connecting a little thing to fill out the comment. Otherwise, I can't fix it. And we're not going big and live until it works great. So I really do need your feedback. This is, we are testing this software. So Comesh is software, it's a web-based database that helps students and faculty and universities and community partners, nonprofits, and governmental organizations all connect. That's what it is. Again, we are in beta testing for it. So here's how it works. The first step is to register. You're going to, oh, there we go. You're going to go to comesh.org and select register. This is what it looks like. Like that. There's the register button. Select student registration. It looks like this. This part's fairly obvious. I have yet to have a student have trouble with it. Complete the registration form. Important. After selecting Sonoma State, be sure to select this class, Living in a Changing World. Otherwise, you will not be able to apply to the Discovery Day or the Saturday opportunities. So this is where it is, right under Sonoma State, it pops up. You're going to select living in a changing world. Don't forget to register by noon on Friday, February 8th. 
The quicker you register, the quicker I will approve you, and then you'll be able to sign up for Saturday and Discovery Day. Step two is wait. Once your registration has been approved, you'll receive an email. Then you can move on to step three. Here's step three. Apply for an opportunity. You're going to go back to ComMesh and log in. So don't forget your username and your password. Otherwise, you won't be able to log in. Select the appropriate radio button and search for the opportunity you want. I selected this one so you could see. Opportunity title, Discovery Day. All I did was enter DIS and Discovery Day popped right up. But there's other radio buttons that you can use that you want to find, Discovery Day, Saturday, or whatever else you're looking for. Select the, opportunity, uh, select the opportunity that you want, and then select Apply. And this is what it looks like. There's the Apply button. So it gives you a little more information. Once the opportunity is filled up and enough of you have applied, you won't be able to see it. So it really is first come, first serve. So if you wait and you don't apply and then you can't find it, it's because it's already filled. Don't forget to apply for an opportunity, especially Discovery Day or Saturday, by 5 p.m. on Tuesday, February 12th. They'll be filled by then. So then step four is do the service. I wouldn't pay too much attention to step four and step five for now because you don't have to remember it, but this is also in, will be embedded in Moodle so you'll be able to come back to it. So once your application has been approved, you'll receive an email. Keep your commitment. Do the service. Remember that, that RUP, Roseland University Prep, those kids are depending on you. And if you end up signing up for something else, that community partner is depending on you. And also remember that since the projects will be filled up, if you do not keep your commitment, you've taken a spot away from another university you're not going to get another chance, so please don't do that. Please show up for what you sign up for. After the service is over, we're going to have a great day on Discovery Day. We're going to have a great day on Saturday. Once it's over, you're going to post your reflection um, and log your project completion right on Comex. You're going to go back to Comex.org and log in. You're going to select My Opportunities and the Add Hours icon under Action. This is what it looks like. Again, I know you won't remember this. I just want you to know that the information is here. So you can see that I, I'm showing you a different example. This is an opportunity as a canvasser with two huggers, which isn't a real organization. And there is a the little button to add your hours. You log your opportunity hours and select Save. So you get to put when you started, when you completed, the hours that you worked, and what you did. And um, Dean Ayala is going to be grading some of these reflections. So you want to talk about what you did and what you learned from it. That's what he's going to be grading. And there it is. I made one. I made a fake one up there. You can see what it says. Um, select the Send Hours for Approval icon under to Total Pending Hours for Submission. That's where it is. You have to send them for approval. It doesn't happen automatically. In case you're wondering why, the reason is if you're doing service throughout the semester or like twice a week, you don't really want to send that all, like twice a week, you want to send it all at once. So it logs it and then you can send it all at once. That's why. Uh, and then you'll receive an email when it's been approved. So you'll know that it was received and that we agree that you did what you said you would do um, and learned what you said you would learn. Your completed log is due two weeks after your service experience and by uh, May 1st. That's how cool that works. After everyone who signed up for this every day and Saturday um, has filled out the org sync form, if you already have other service, has applied for independent projects, that's when we're going to contact the volunteer center for Sonoma County and let them know how many other people need opportunities. So when you log on to Comex, um, if this every day and Saturday are full, don't panic. We are just waiting until after the 11th to see how many people have already had service and how many projects we need to put up there. And then we can let you know um, when new projects are up there for you to sign up. So if, it's, if they're already full, please don't panic. Um, we are working on it. We just need to know how many people need opportunities and how many people have already um, completed service throughout with other opportunities. Question. So that slide is available on Moodle if you, if you have not seen it, okay? Um, but that, that form is available on Moodle. It's a, it's a org.com something source. 
And if you go to Middle, at the middle of the way down on this particular community service um, assignment, you will see that place to go. Okay? So, so if, you, if I were to go back into Middle, you would see the timeline posting, and right underneath it is the community service thing. All the links, everything is embedded in there. If you have hours to post, that's, if you have hours to, to post, you submit that form. Okay. How many of you will be using community service hours that you'll be doing somewhere else? Oh, so this is fun. Questions? 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 So on Monday, or the actual class on Monday, there's some reading that you need to do um, before Wednesday. A hundred of you have not signed up for the work course yet, and you're going to have a thing you're going to have to sign up for, so you've got to get moving.